What an honor to be um, speaking here with other health professionals in the common united goal of trying to help our patients stay well um, so they don't need us. I think that's the highest calling of a doctor. At the end of tonight's talk, and my goal is that you will look at something that you do every day that all humans do the majority of their day, and you'll look at it fundamentally different. 54% um, of each day, not even the waking hours, but each day is spent sitting. Um, and it's something that, at least in Western society, we do really poorly. Um, Dr. Murray might uh, recognize this picture. This is where we do our chart noting there at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. And in my last rotation, which was in December, part of the reason I love to go out to the Olympic Training Center is to be around so many amazing sports medicine professionals. I always learn things and challenge me to become a better doctor. But also, um, I kind of have little paradigm shifts when I'm out there. Because you're in this environment, living on the campus with the athletes, and uh, eating in the dining hall with them, certainly treating them. And you start to see health differently. You also have never seen glutes as strong. <laughs> I come back, patients like Lyle Taylor okay, say, oh, these are unlike what I've seen. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I noticed was that Regardless of whether the athletes were working out six to eight hours a day in their sport, six or seven days a week, uh, I'd see them in the dining hall seated in slump, right? I'd see them waiting for treatments, looking the same. And so we see this all around us. Um, it's all too common. And yet I know as a chiropractor and someone that studied anatomy and physiology, um, that this person isn't comfortable, that their muscles are um, over-tightened and stretched, that they're losing thoracic mobility, uh, the scapula isn't working like it should, the hamstrings are getting shortened, and all sorts of things that those athletes, six to eight hours a day, are trying to train out of themselves, they'd be putting it back in when we were sitting in the dining room. So, why? <laughs> why when we know uh, that we want to sit good, uh, when seating seems like a pretty simple thing, do we have such a trouble doing that? And I think. Um, I've come up with, I think there's three myths that we've been taught about good posture, good seated posture. The first one, there's my son, my first son, when he was about, uh, in, he was one, sitting in an alphabet soup there. And um, no one ever taught him to sit up straight. I guarantee you he isn't thinking, Dad's taking a picture, so I better straighten up, right? We all had, and if you look at one to three-year-olds, they all sit pretty perfectly, right? They're born innately with that, knowing how to do that. And we lose it. If we go to primitive cultures, we also see that they maintain good postures. So the first myth, I, first myth, I would say, is that we just need to think about it. We also know it doesn't work, right? You guys, we've all done it. The second one is to do postural exercises. And I'll be the first one to say that exercise is fabulous. Couldn't stand here and not say that. Um, but if we did exercise for three hours a day, let's say six to eight hours a day, like the Olympic athletes, would we just naturally have amazing posture? And I didn't see that, at least in sitting, right? Um, if you want, you can do 30 minutes of posture exercise a day, but we don't see it really leads to someone having a fundamentally different posture. And then there are always people that'll want to sell you stuff, right? So we can get around. There's tons of studies on this chair that say that it's really good for your low back. Uh, as a chiropractor, I also have to look upwards on the spine and the thoracic spine and the, and the cervical spine, my God, that'd be a, a nightmare. So do we need great furniture to sit? I'm gonna show you some pictures that would show otherwise. So how did I get here? Um, this is in our office. We have a smaller classroom, but we believe that teaching patients is an important part of being a doctor. Um, I was a year and a half into practice. I had a patient with tennis elbow. Helped him with a tennis elbow when I was taking the history said, have you ever had back or neck pain? And his answer changed the trajectory of my practice career. He said, I used to have low back pain, but I took a class on how to sit, and I haven't had back pain since. And here I'd spent four years in pre-med, four years in chiropractic school, $200,000 on my education, and they'd never sat down and said, hey, well, you know, you're gonna spend all this time sitting down. Let's teach you how to sit, right? So I said, where? He said, to Palo Alto and studied with Jean Couch. I took an hour and 15 minute class with her, and fundamentally I saw sitting differently. 
Um, what I did over the next seven years was send hundreds of patients up there to get that class. What I saw is when they'd come back, they sat better, they had less pain, and when they laid down on the table, their muscles and their joints were fundamentally different. I did that for seven years, and then I said, maybe I should learn this stuff too. <laughs> so I went out and studied with Gene and uh, Jen, her partner, and uh, then they said, hey, why don't you travel to France with us? Our teacher is there, and Noelle Perret spent her life uh, studying, writing books, lecturing, studying primitive cultures, and learning how they sat. She's now in her early 90s, there she's in her late 80s, and um, so I went and did that in late 2014. And this work is based on her, her work. So how would we change the way we sit? There's two types of muscles in the body. There's many different ways to characterize muscles, but there's one way which says that there's postural muscles and phasic muscles. So we're getting close to Thanksgiving. Uh, postural muscles are the dark meat. They're meant to do a small load over a protracted period of time. And then you have the white meat, which is like your biceps, your deltoid, which you're meant to do a large load over a really short period of time, right? I could hold this stick out here for maybe five minutes, right? Um, but I should be able to hold my body in the axis of gravity. You'll notice that her school is called the Institut de Plum, which literally means like the school on the plumb bob or on the axis of gravity. So, uh, the idea would be, let's say that the stick weighed as much as an average human's body, let's say 150 pounds. If I was to try and hold it here, like this, um, it would take a large amount of effort. I'd get fatigued, I'd wanna put it against the wall, someone to help me, okay? You guys being wiser than me would say, hey, as long as you gotta hold the stick over, let's just hold it right in that axis of gravity, right? Putting minor little inputs, just like your postural muscles are meant to do when you sit and stand. Once in a while, you'd be able to let go. It's like those rocks are balancing. If you ever want to look at an amazing website, Gravity Blue, this guy goes and stacks rocks all over the place and uses the axis of gravity. So this gentleman, what does it feel like when the bones of your spine are stacked one on top of each other and instead of using those basic muscles, you just have the little muscles of your spine, the postural muscles, uh, activated. So our vertebrae are flat on the top. These bones here are all the vertebral bodies. They're flat on the top, flat on the bottom. And that's true, except when we get right down to the bottom here. At L5, we know that the vertebrae is wedge-shaped, bigger in the front, smaller in the back. And the same with the L4-5 and the L5-S1 discs, okay? And what happens there, this is your sacrum bone. You have something called your sacral base angle. There's another slide that's gonna show it. And if someone places their pelvis right, like this gentleman's doing a great job there in India of doing on his super ergonomic chair, right? <laughs> Looks like he has very well-developed buttocks because he's rotated his pelvis this way. It puts the sacrum in a position that allows the normal anatomy of the spine to then stack these blocks. And then just like that stick in the axis of gravity, you have to put almost no effort in. And what that feels like is that the body gets silent and your muscles relax and you don't fidget in your chair. And it means that when you sit down for a meal with a loved one, you get to enjoy the conversation and be present. And if you watch an amazing film, then you take that in more fully. And if you're at work, you do better work because your body's not constantly talking to you. I think it's part of the reason, maybe, it's all just a theory, but why kids learn so quickly and are so engaged in things. Their body's not giving them all the signals that your body might be giving them. That might be how, uh, how people are sitting. So the pelvis is tucked underneath him, and you guys know now anatomically that that's gonna shoot the spine back towards the back of the chair, and thank God there's a chair back there, or he'd be doing a crunch with no muscles. <laughs> continuous crunch. And then for this skeleton to interact with whoever they're with, um, they have to round their upper back and their neck to be able to interact, right? This is the posture if he was standing up that we see as people age, right? Not gracefully, and it doesn't look good. So this is the last set of pictures that I'll show you. Uh, and then I'd like to spend five minutes and, and have you guys feel this. Um, but this young woman here is learning to play piano, obviously really enthusiastically. Right? Her parents are saying, we're spending all this money, and she's saying, why couldn't they have invented uh, piano benches you know, with a back to them? 
And so uh, this would have been me drawn up. Someone would come into the room and say, sit up straight or posture is important. So I'd use my mind and my phasic muscles and I'd hold myself there, right? So she's using her lat and her lower trapezius and some of her lumbar uh, muscles there, phasic muscles to hold herself up. And she can do that. It doesn't look comfortable. She won't hold that for long. Either the muscles will fatigue out and become tingly and upset, um, or she'll forget and she'll go right back there. So back and forth, back and forth. Um, she gets frustrated. That's why it's very hard sell to get people to come to our sitting class because they think it's going to be us teaching them how to do that. Um, what it truly is, is we teach them how to do that number three, which is subtly different, but vastly, uh, feels vastly different and makes all the difference. Um, so, I'd like to teach you guys how to do that last one. Yeah. Okay. And what we're going to do in this exercise is going to require you to try and harness both of those. Okay, listening to your body first and then trying to be able to relax things because we're used to holding tension. Okay? So these bones here are called your sit bones. And your sit bones, uh, if they're tucked underneath you, it's going to send the spine back like that picture you saw of the skeleton. We're gonna try and be sitting almost on the front of the sit bones. That's our goal. We'll see if we can get there. Okay, that gentleman in India is sitting closer to that. And then the spine would be able to go vertically. Is we're gonna hinge at our hips when we go to sit down, um, where everyone loses mobility most, and it's what gets you into a retirement home, uh, is losing the ability to get in and out of a chair, which also means on and off the toilet and things by yourself. So um, we're gonna hinge at our hips. Our hips are here, not here, or here, but here. And pick up your legs and feel the hinge joint move there. Awesome, cool. When we go to sit down, we're gonna hinge at our hips, keeping our spine straight and really pushing our butt out backwards like that, okay? So are you guys ready? Okay. So we'll come back like this. Good, and really push your butt back. Doesn't matter so much that it's back towards the back of the chair, but we want it rotated this way. So that might feel a little different to you. Right now, we're gonna take that to the next level. So bring your legs back around the side of the chair. We're gonna place our hands in the middle of the chair here. And we're gonna take our weight up onto our hands. No one is watching you. We're gonna bring our butt up like this against the back of the chair and we're gonna drag it down. Don't tuck it underneath you as you get to the bottom. Leave it really tilted backwards. Great. Bring your legs back around. Good. Um, so our legs are back around. The next thing we've been taught is to suck in our belly. Try it. Suck in your belly. Do you notice how that kind of tightens your lower back and almost kind of takes your lumbar spine and arches it backwards? So you're just going to relax your belly. You can't hold it anyways. Liberating. Yeah. And then the next thing that we're going to do is what have we been taught to do with our chest? Yeah, stick it up. So let's do that. Stick it up. Hold it up. What do you feel when you do that? Strain where? Yeah, in between the shoulder blades and kind of right down here like thoracolumbar junction. Unfortunately, human beings do not have a muscle that attaches to the ceiling coming off their sternum to pick them up. So the only way you can do that is to bend in your lower back. So if you have pain or tingling or that kind of thing, back here on your back or in between your shoulder blades, it's more often than not that you're trying to hold a good posture. You can't hold it. If your pelvis has been set correctly, then your vertebra will stack on top of each other. You can just relax, relax your chest down. And your vertebral bodies will hold themselves. You won't fall over forward. That was the hardest one for me to get. And then once we've done that, we can take our shoulder blade like we're reaching back in the back seat of a car, and then bring your arm around. Do the other side, keeping your chest down. Good. One side at a time, good. Now your shoulder blades are back a little bit, just relax them. You can't hold them back there. This is all about relaxation. Are they where they should be? No. Will they get there in a year if you do that every day? Probably. They'll get a lot farther. And then if you've given yourself that space, then you can relax your chin back just a little bit. Again, this is a journey and a progression. And it's not something that you're going to get perfect today. I don't think that I'll ever get it perfect, but I'm working towards trying to get back to what my son has at one. Right. Well, it's listening to your body. And, um, the, and I will let you know, uh, if you don't set your pelvis right, none of that other stuff I taught you, relaxing your belly, dropping here, what you do with your shoulders matters. 
because you haven't worked from the foundation up setting things properly. So thank you very much for the opportunity to